Well, welcome everyone to yet another Monday morning masterclass. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Scott Burleson, and we've got a fun one for you today. So I'm just going to start with a little story uh, of something that happened back in 2012, and then we'll get the real authority going here. So I was training this, uh, we've trained probably a couple hundred people, this one particular client. And there's this one lady who was just doing standout work. She was just nailing everything. And then one day, you know, she showed me how she was getting these interviews set up with people. She would, she told them, she said, I'm going to be sharing the industry research with those who participate. Then she showed them this beautiful market research report, very narrow, just on their tight market segment, maybe 10, 12 pages. It was beautiful. And she had people drooling and they were getting in line to do these interviews with her. And so for the next eight years, I would wave my arms and tell people without disclosing any details about this really cool approach. Well, now I'm happy to tell you uh, that was Kelly Lawrence, and she is with us now. She is part of the AIM Institute. And so, Kelly, if you don't mind, I've asked you to put a little bio at the, on your first slide. If you don't mind, I will stop sharing my screen. Why don't you share your screen, and I'll say a few more words here, and then we'll let you take us through some really interesting stuff here. So Kelly um, uh, is a, an amazing marketing professional. I've learned so much from her, has tremendous energy and a lot of great ideas. And this is a very original idea she came up with, as I say, in 2012. And she's been able to use this not only to set up interviews, but all, much more successfully, but also to engage customers. So all the way through the process, all the way through product launch. So as she's covering this material, imagine you're the customer dealing with Kelly and think about how welcoming it would be, how engaged you would feel. And everything Kelly's gonna show you what she did, she's gonna show you how you can do this as well. So I'm gonna stop talking now, Kelly. Why don't you take it over? And let me also say this to everybody. As you know, we like to spend about 30 minutes on a topic. And this is the topic of new market insights report Kelly's created. We'll show you where you can download it in the blue help and the blue tool section. Uh, but we'll keep it informal. So if you have questions as Kelly's going through this, just stop her at any point in time and ask questions. And then we'll try to keep most of the second 30 minutes for any general questions you've got. I'm going to stop talking, Kelly. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Scott. Really happy to be here with you guys today. And as Dan said, I know firsthand how hard it can be to do a blueprinting project. You're under a lot of pressure. How fast? Every manager asks, how much and how soon? It's the bottom line of what they want to know every day. So what we're gonna talk about is how to use this custom market insight report to accelerate your project to improve the project hit rate, to improve your project ROI, because it helps you get there faster. And one of the challenges that Dan said is, how do I get a discovery interview? And we'll talk about some of those objections and how to overcome them. Especially if you, know, if you have the customer, great. But when you're looking for new business, oftentimes you want customers you don't have. And if they don't know you, how do you build the trust to get them to participate with you? Another one is sales team buy-in. Anybody have sales ever say, I'm not taking marketing with me to meet a customer? You guys overpromise. you guys under deliver. What are you gonna do? How long is it gonna take to come out with a new product? I, I've heard a lot of those objections and we're gonna talk about how to overcome that how to get sales to see that you are going to positively impact their wallet and they will be begging for you to come to their customer meetings with them. How do you keep your customer engaged after discovery? You don't wanna just have that one-time discussion and then the customer goes away. How do you get feedback on your new products? I was in raw materials. I had people come to me and say, wow, it's been six months. I haven't gotten customer feedback. Well, why not? 
And I'm telling you, I had customers after I started doing this process, I had customers give me feedback within 24 hours of receiving samples. That's how impactful this can be. Six months down to 24 hours. What kind of an impact might that make on your projects? Confirming viability of that R&D proposed solution. When we go through blueprinting, we're coming up with outcomes, right? We're not coming up with solutions. You're gonna take those outcomes and those satisfaction gaps and your teams are gonna brainstorm ways to solve. Well, you want the customer to weigh in on that, right? And how do you get to an R&D project profile? I heard that question a lot. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how this helps you get there. And then the other big question, how do you maintain management's interest, keep the investment, because these projects can take a very long time, especially when you're inventing something new and a breakthrough innovation. So for the agenda today, we're gonna to talk about what is a market insights report. We're gonna pull one up and let you guys dig through it and see what the content is. We're going to talk about how to use it and where it fits within the blueprinting process. Special hint, it fits in a lot of different places. There are at least five. How a market insights report is going to help you get to yes faster, get those interviews, win your sales team support, deepen your customer engagement, validate that you do indeed have a winning solution, that will get revenue at the end and will continue to get that management investment. So what is a custom market insight report? This is really a professional summary of your blueprinting case study. It's going to use data from discovery interviews, data from your preference interviews, and data from your secondary research to build this thing. And you know, Dan and I were talking earlier at Scott and we said, you know, there's, there's a balance here. One of the scares, and I faced this early on in putting this together with management, how do you give away something without giving away too much? And we're gonna talk about that. But this whole thing is really a way to maximize the ROI on your discovery research. How many of us are doing blueprinting alongside our day jobs? How many of us have management that says, yeah, 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 go give me new products, but they don't send you to meet with customers. They don't allow you the budget. This is the tool that I found that made this upfront research absolutely essential to management and help them recognize the need for that investment. The other thing that management often asks, okay, well, what if we don't decide to invest, then what? To which I say it's even more critical to offer a market insight report because those customers whether you decide to develop a solution or not, those customers invested time in you and they trusted you to come in and share their problems. If you don't have a solution, that's okay, but you have to tell them and you have to give them something back for giving you that time because you might have a solution for them in the future. And if you don't follow up, guess what? you lost the trust. So I would say it's even more critical when you're not going to move forward with a new product development to give them the insight report. So let's go over here for a second. And I'm gonna show you, if you go into your blueprintingcenter.com and you click on blue tools, you're going to find the insight report actually in two different places. You're going to see it here under discovery interviews, all the way down at the bottom. And you're going to see it again under preference interviews, all the way down here. 
We're going to talk about why here in a second. But let's show you here a sample report so you can see what it is. And so what I do is create a report with the company branding on the front. This is a sample market insight report. We're going to cover our retail packaging insights for Acme packaging following along our samples in our blueprinting software. And this can be your company name. This whole front cover can be branded, whatever your company is. And then we say this is really provided by us. This is an exclusive. You're only getting this if you participate with us. Typical table of contents. You'll tell your, your customer your methodology. Your secondary, this involves secondary market research as well as primary. This is stuff that you can't get anywhere else. Make them feel special. You're going to give them an overview of the industry. What's happening? What are some of the major trends and drivers that are leading you to make some of the decisions you're making? Tell them about the value chain. Tell them about some of the key people, you know, that are the roles, not, not specific companies maybe, but talk about the roles of that value chain. Talk about some of the unmet needs. And you can see here how you can do this. These are actually quotes that you would get out of your discovery interviews. And then you can tell them the place in the value chain. It's a corrugated manufacturer. It's a retailer. It's a label manufacturer. It's an OEM. It's a chemistry provider. It's a substrate manufacturer. It's a converter. It's a brand. Yeah. And tell me, yeah. tell me if I have, tell, tell me if I have this wrong, yeah. but I think, you know, the first, uh, you know, sections here up until I'm at needs are what you would have done anyway for secondary research. The last part is where you bring in blueprinting and tell me if I'm wrong with this, but I think for a lot of your experience and a lot of other clients, you had to do some of the secondary research along the way anyway for your project to make sure it's an attractive market. So you're just taking work you'd already done, but you're helping to package it for your customers and then add on your specific research, correct? Your Absolutely. blueprinting research. Great summary, Dan. This is the stuff you should be doing as a team anyway. So you're really maximizing your ROI. You're just taking everything that you have and you're packaging it for your customer. So you can kind of see here a little bit of how that goes. And so here, see with the quotes, you're not giving anything away. You're not telling them that you talk to P&G. You're not telling them that you talk to Kelly Lawrence. You're not giving away anything. So you're keeping everything completely confidential. And then you give a little industry overview. You can highlight some of your data partners. And then you can put in some really cool graphs to show them maybe how the value chain is changing. Maybe you take the idea of jobs to be done and you show the process and what kind of an impact might be had if you could save some steps. And then here at the end, you'll see some charts. And you'll notice these are talking about commonly cited unmet needs. You'll notice that we're talking about least satisfied but we're not actually giving the very detailed charts from our blueprinting software. Because if we go to our blueprinting software example and we look at our satisfaction gaps, that gives us a lot of information. But we can take those charts and we can use some information and we can tell our customers about the commonality of a given problem. And then that way, if this does end up in the hands of a competitor, okay, vertical crushing came up a whole lot or glue separation came up a lot. Well, does that really help our competitor develop something new? Probably not. But if you were to give away the whole market satisfaction gap, then you would give your comp competition a lot more direction. So that's kind of that balance that we talked about between giving a little, show your customer that you speak their language, that you understand them better than your competition does, but don't give them so much in the form of a leave behind that it can be shared and hurt you. And Kelly, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but 
you know, it's almost like there's this um, spectrum or this gradient. And on one end, we're not going to give anything back to our customers because it might get in our competitors' hands, but you get very little engagement. You know, it's like a one-way street. On the other hand, we're going to we're going to show them our blueprint or software and show them everything we have, the market, everything. But gosh, if just one of them gets that in the competitor's hand, that's not good. And in fact, I think for most industries, there's a balance. It's somewhere in between. And I like some of the charts you've got here. Now, I think the most commonly cited, that's just coming out of your, you know, what you saw in your discovery, right? It's just, it's not terribly, it's somewhat useful, but it's not quantitative yet. And the other two charts are quantitative, but you're not giving them the full picture on these things either. So good balance. Yeah. And one of the things that I like to do, I like to go in and present these findings to customers. And I like to have an accompanying PowerPoint and I like to give them the data in the PowerPoint first. And then there I might give them a whole lot more data and I might tell them what I'm thinking about as a solution. And then I give them the report as the leave behind. So you can do a combination of the two and you can give your customer a lot of information but not give them the leave behind with all the detail. And that's really an internal decision on how you do it. So let's talk a little bit more about where we find this. So let's go to Blue Help. And if we go to Blue Help and we type in here market report, we'll see what is a market insights report. We'll bring this up here. So we just talked about it. You've now seen it. So let's talk about discovery interviews. How do we get those to be a little bit easier? Scott, will you be my customer for a minute? I'd be happy to. Fantastic. Hey, Scott, this is Kelly. You know, we're doing some new development in R&D, and I'm looking for industry experts around the world. And of course you came top of mind. I'd really, really appreciate it if you could participate in this with me. You'll get a chance to talk to our top experts. You're gonna to get to help prioritize our R&D. And as a thank you for your time, I'm gonna give you a copy of our data. We call it a market insight report. How does that sound? You know, that sounds great. You know, when I think about it, you know, I did a voice with a customer with another company before and, and they never followed up. Oh man, that, that must have been really annoying. You know, I'm going to promise you we are going to follow up. And I know that might sound hollow. Let me show you an example of what that follow up is going to look like. Yeah. Here's a sample market insight report we've done in the past. And you can see it takes you through a lot of the secondary data, but also the primary data that we have. But you can also see that the information from each participant is kept very confidential and it is very high level. So no one will be able to attribute any of the specific things that you say back to you. Would you be willing to participate with me knowing that you're going to get this valuable kind of information? Well, it would be really useful to learn that. I have to say there's some interesting, in interesting information you have uh, there. I'd love to know that about my own market as well. So sure, why not? Fantastic. Thanks so much. Let me send you an email as follow-up. And in that email, I'm going to share with you a couple of different things. I'm going to share with you a copy of the Market Insight Report. I'm going to share with you, so in that way you can share that with your internal team so they know what they're going to get. I'm also going to share with you um, the Have You Been Discovered link so that you can share that with your team so you guys can also know what to expect. How's that sound? That sounds great. Let's do it. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now we've got our interview scheduled. We sent our follow-up email. We gave Scott a promise, right? We gave him a copy, a sample of our custom insight report. And you can certainly share the one we, we have here. Or, you know, once you start creating your own, you'll be able to share the ones that are branded with your company and show them what you have. So then you're going to move on and you're going to be talking about building engagement. 
you're going to actually do your discovery interviews. And so you're going to start using this with your sales team. And you're going to be able to talk to your sales team about some of the findings that you've had and then say, okay, let's go back. Let's go back and present this to the customer. And that's when you're going to go through your discovery research. I would recommend actually putting all your data together after preference. That way you have a comprehensive view. You've had your discussions as a team as to where you want to go. And then you can be bringing back, here's what we found. Here's what we're thinking we're going to do with it. What's your thoughts there? Are you willing to participate with us in test marketing? How's the viability of this solution sound? What concerns do you have? How should we measure success? Can we talk to your technical team? Can we calibrate on the type of equipment we're using, how we're reading that equipment? And just make sure that we're testing in an apples to apples kind of a way so that we're really providing value. As remember, the best teams, there's always, there's always something that we've usually missed. And sometimes that's something we've missed isn't our fault. It's just because markets change, they're dynamic. Scott, you've done a lot of new product development in your career. Have you ever had an example where at the end you found something new that you didn't expect and you had to adjust? Uh, approximately 100% of the time. <laughs> well said, me, me too, unfortunately. It happens. So it's a really good opportunity to use the customer insight report to engage that customer to make sure that they're going to stay with you throughout the whole process. And when you do that, you've done a couple things. You've given your sales team a reason to call. You've given credibility to yourself and your team with sales because sales frequently says, are you really going to follow up with my customer? Are you really going to do what you said you're going to do? I've actually found selling my internal team is harder than selling the external customer. Any, any other product managers in the past find that problem? Kelly, 100%. In fact, I'd really love this third bullet. You know, I've, I've often said that, you know, with, with voice of the customer, you know, we spend a lot of time gathering those customer insights. And I, we get really focused on this project and gathering insights. But meanwhile, there's a whole company we work for. There's leadership who they had some ideas of what we should be doing. There's engineers. They had some preconceived ideas. You've got marketing folks. They've got some preconceived ideas about what the messages should be. So to your point, when we learn these surprising things, that's not always welcomed information. And so to communicate those insights internally is a tremendously, I, you can't overstate the importance of being able to do that. Because at the end of the day, if you can't bring your engineers' hearts and minds along to solve this new problem, it probably won't be solved as well as it could be. So I love this third, this third usefulness of the report. That's a great point, Scott. And you know, the other thing that brings up is versioning. And I say that because I've done a number of these where when you present to the customer, you need to present in the customer's language. If the customer is located in Europe, you better darn well be talking in metric measurements. If your customer is in the United States, you might need to talk about pounds instead of kilos, right? And as we, as we have these conversations, sometimes the customer's language does not match our internal language. And so if you take this exact report that's written beautifully for your customer because you understand them, guess what? Your internal audience is not coming with you because they don't understand. Uh, once upon a time ago, I was starting a company, uh, an internal business where we were developing inkjet inks and the customers around the world expected those to be sold in a liter package, in a volume basis. And I had to convince my internal team, who was very much a 
pound basis or a kilo basis, why we needed to sell something in a volume basis. And it had a big impact on the operational aspects. So versioning and creating different versions so that you can explain the customer's terminology and the why behind why you're going to make some special requests internally can really help bring your full team on board. Scott or Dan, anything to add on that? I love it. I'm just sitting there. I'm just sitting here um, nodding my head. Yeah, it's just, I mean, that internal group, you know, and I, it's just like, I think also it just, it's, um, it's just good for us as we're doing our blueprinting projects to already be thinking about or how are we going to communicate this internally? And then, you know what, we're going to run across this insight along the way that mm, here's, Maybe our engineers are working on this one particular problem and, you know, and we learn that, that it's really not a big deal, <laughs> right? You, you learn these things that you know are going to be a bit controversial when you go in. And between with, with blueprinting and voice of the customer, you know what that does is it takes the ego out of the, out of the conversation. Instead of it being Scott's idea or Kelly's idea or Dan's idea, this is what the customers are saying instead of what I am saying as an individual. And I love, I love how the Market Insights Report, it just helps to better communicate that because some people speak in the language of data and if you just show them the numbers, they're good. But for other folks, it's really nice or it's helpful to really connect those dots a little more explicitly as opposed to just show the numbers and step back and just assume that they're, they're making all those connections to their, especially if they've been working on something a long time and it's, you know, they don't really want to make those connections. You know, you made me think of another one. How many of us have worked on long-term projects where the project team or the management team changed? Yeah. All the time, especially when you're doing the new business development and you're doing some of the really horizon three, long-term and strategic innovation, pick, pick what you want to call it, the longer the project, the more likely that is to happen, either internally or at the customer. And this is a great way to go back and say, look, this is all the research we did, all the things that you forgot because you've moved on so much and you know it so internally. This is a great way to easily bring it up when that impromptu conversation comes with the new CEO that says, hey, why are we spending money on this thing? And so instead of getting frustrated and going, oh my gosh, I got to do another, like spend another week on this internal presentation, you can say, I got that for you. Here was our logic. This is what we did. This is what we shared with customers. This was their response to this. So you we're know, good for the next investment, right, Dan? Yeah, I like the idea of uh, also the versioning. And let me also say this. I'm gonna, we'll open it up for any questions and comments other people have, but let me seed it here a little bit because you know, one of the things we like to do is engage customers. And I love what you said, uh, Kelly, about how this engages people because you're bringing something back to them. And tell me if you've seen this much, but um, it seems to me, well, you know, Scott and I, we're in the B2B business. And so we're, we've been learning a lot about how to promote offerings and so forth from people who are expert in marketing to B2B. And one of the most powerful ways of marketing, they call it content marketing, is where you offer valuable content, like a white paper, a technical paper. Mm -hmm. And typically, if you've, got a, um, if you've got an eight or 10 page white paper, the first eight or nine pages tell you about a problem the industry is facing and you give them valuable information. And then you talk about in high level terms, you know, what needs to be addressed. And then the back of the white paper, you say, and here's an example how this company, which happens to be us, is solving this problem. So can we take this kind of report and then do a version of it for our product launch where we say now, as you notice, abrasion resistance was the biggest problem. And here's an example of how this new product from company ABC is solving this. That is a great segue, Dan, and absolutely we can. And let me pull us back here over to our slide deck and move you guys up so you can see the whole picture. And yeah, absolutely. You know, we can go over here 
and we've got our product launch. And so we want to take this data and we want to engage new customers and tell them why we developed this thing. Now, the balance, of course, is, all right, I interviewed you and I promised Scott at the beginning, this is exclusive to you. So if I share the same data that I shared with Scott with everybody else at the end, then I have de-incentivized people to participate in the next one. So I've got to be really careful with that data management and that trust that I've built. And I've got to share something different when I do my launch. So when I do my launch, I got to think about, okay, let me share the methodology of everything that I did. Let me share some of the secondary research and the trends that are relevant that support the problems we're going to solve the profitable problems we're going to solve. And here's our solution and how we got there. There's that. So just a real quick wrap up before we launch into all the questions, where do we use the insight report? We use them in discovery interviews, right? Because it helps us get to yes faster. That's how I get my existing customers. It's how I get my new customers to talk to me when I don't have a relationship. It's the start of building trust and building that relationship that you're going to need to get to the sale. You're going to do it again after you do the preference interviews because that's when you're gonna really take the data. You're gonna win your sales team support. You're gonna give them a reason to call and you're gonna create that insight report. You're gonna do it again at the project objectives because you're gonna go back to that customer and you're gonna say, okay, remember that insight report? Remember all that stuff I showed you? I, I've, I've taken a stab at putting a project profile together. Here are the minimums and maximums of each attribute that I think this minimum viable product needs to have. Can you comment on this for me? Remember our minimums and our maximums? It's gonna come back. That's gonna deepen your customer engagement. And that's going to get that customer saying, yes, I want to be a part of your test marketing and give you feedback on the prototypes when they come out of technical. That's going to take you to your business case. And that's when you're really going to take all the data from your original version. Remember, our original version was in our customer speak. And you're going to flip that around for your management team. And you're going to tell them how much you're going to bring in, how fast you're going to do it, and here's why. Here's all the reason that you should have confidence in the investment you're making in this project, in this team, in these customers to deliver this solution. And then you're gonna get that permission, you're gonna develop. You've already had the customer say, yes, I will test your prototype. So when that prototype comes out of R&D, it's very easy, you call them up and say, hey, this prototype's gonna be ready for you a couple months. Just want to tee it up. You're ready? Yeah, okay. Then it comes out. Hey, this prototype, it's ready for you. Wonderful. We're all teed up for that. I can give you feedback in, is it 24 hours? Is it two weeks? Depends on the urgency of the problem. But you're going to be prioritized in that test lab. And then you're going to do launch. And that's when you're going to have you know, that last bit of internal support that you have to secure because at that point of launch is really when you have to pass the race baton on to the next runner in that relay, right? You're passing it on to your sales team and they have not necessarily all been involved in all this. And so you're teaching them how to sell the product, how to engage customers, how to find those reasons to believe. And you're using the language from all these reports, all this learning, and you're creating that, that launch piece, like Dan was talking about, that content piece that says, this is why this solution is great for you. And this is ultimately how we work together to maximize the ROI on all that work that you're doing in the upfront side of innovation. So what questions do you guys have? And I'll give folks a few seconds to form their questions because I've got one here, Kelly. Uh, two, one point and one question. You know, when you were talking about arming your salespeople, 
the challenger sale has been a very popular method that shows when a salesperson can come in with new information and challenge the customer with new fresh ideas. So I would think any sales professional would love to be able to bring in something like this when it's time to market it. But the question I have is this. So I could see some folks on the call or listening to a Monday masterclass uh, video, you know, tape recording later uh, saying, gosh, I want to do this. And I think one approach is they can download this report from um, Blue Help or Blue Tools and they can just do it their own. They can pull in market research, secondary research. They can do they can emulate some of the things you've done. And that's great. I can see others saying, oh, man, I'm already pretty darn busy. Kelly, can you help me with this? Could you explain to them? Because you've set up a little business model. This wouldn't be through AIM, but it'd be through Lawrence Innovation. Maybe tell them what that would look like if they wanted to get some help from you. Yeah, absolutely. If you want some help with these, you know, give me a call. And that help can range from, hey, we want to do this ourselves, but we just, we just want somebody to kind of look at it, be an editor, help guide us. And that's a pretty low investment. And it can go all the way up to Kelly, create this thing for me. I don't have time to do my upfront market research. I really am strapped, but I, I know I need to do this. I know I need my upfront research, help me out. And then I can help you do that secondary market research, help you with your discovery interviews, and then we can create this report. So really the support that you need is really dependent upon you guys, right? What level do you need? And then we'll provide that for you. Great. Questions anybody has for Kelly? And then we're going to go to a general, any question you've got part of the, uh, of the uh, session here. And I think if you want to reach out to Kelly, I'd probably the easiest way is just to go to Blue Tools, download the report so you got the sample. I think at the end, you've got your contact information, Kelly. I've got one last question. I love asking questions. I had no idea what the answer is. How many times have you done this yourself? A lot. <laughs> Somewhere yeah. hundreds, thousands, I, I've lost track. Yeah, I have yeah. one going on right now. And it's in an industry where I have some contacts, but not all the ones throughout the value chain. And using this approach, I have gotten 25 interviews booked with people I don't know in a two week period. 25 interviews booked in a two week period and you did not know these people beforehand. Correct. And how much do you think that the offer of the industry research was a part of them saying yes? It is the thing that makes them say yes. Okay, all right. So this is another quiver we've all got all blueprinting uh, folks here. We've got a lot of other tools, you know, send them the have you been discovered this and that, but perhaps the most powerful tool we have is gives them some research to give them a reason to be part of this. It's not a one-way street. Well, thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the day Monday and let us know if we can help in any way, okay? Thanks everybody.